My name is John Benet Ramsey, and I'm five and a half. Is that because they found no entrance into the house? We don't know. Why. Well, we know, Larry, that, that a window was open. Under that window was a suitcase, as if a step for a step to get up through it. We learned later that they found a door open, uh, which I didn't know about until uh, almost a year later. Um, that house was, was not difficult to get in. There's a lot of evidence. The police... Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is episode 3 in the Khan's Order series. And in this episode, the judge reviews the events that transpired severely compromising the crime scene. In this episode, we will deal with page 11, page 12, 13, 14... 15 and 16 of the 93 page report. What I want to pay particular attention to are John's comments as highlighted in the Khan's order about the open basement window. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, please do like, share, leave a comment. I'll be doing a live stream tomorrow partially on the subject. So if you want to be alerted to that, click the notification bell and let's get started. So page 11 kicks off with a series of events that transpired that severely compromised the crime scene. And what she's really talking about here is the behavior of the police officers, of the investigators. There's another way to think about it, which is that some other people severely compromised or perhaps covered up the crime scene. You could argue that the ransom note is something that is severely manipulating the crime scene to make it look in a different way. That the movement of John Bonet's body from wherever it was to the wine cellar and from the wine cellar to the upstairs hallway and from there to the Christmas tree, that that also severely compromised the crime scene um, but let's go with the judge's narrative. And this is quoting from the Khan's order. Officer Rick French of the Boulder Police arrived at the defendant's home in a marked car a few minutes before 6 a.m. I don't know if it was a few minutes. I think it was really something like 5.59, may, might have been 5.57, but uh, it really didn't take him a long time to get there. From Officer Rick French's own report, this is not in the Khan's order, but what he says is that he responded to the 911 call at 0555, but we know that he got there before 6 p.m., which implies that he got there very shortly before 6 p.m., right? It's something that is frustratingly unclear. Just a simple detail like that is at what exact time did he get there? And fortunately, in today's law enforcement world, often the police body cam and cell phones can provide um, the exact timestamp in terms of that. And it was followed soon after by Detective Arndt. Now, that just isn't true. So this is a summary provided by the judge. It's just not true. Um, he pro so Rick French arrived just before 6 but Detective Linda Arndt arrived at 10 past 8. That's two hours, 10 minutes later. I, I wouldn't say that that is soon after. Now, you might say that this is nitpicking over details, but, you know, there's a saying that if you can't be honest about small things, you can't be trusted with big things. And it might be uh, some a reference to how you treat uh, money or how you treat, you know, how trustworthy you are with relationships or whatever. But I think the same applies with facts. If you're not trustworthy with small information, trustworthy might be the wrong word. If you're just not really paying attention to the small details, how are you going to be able to get the big details right? So that's something that I think is very important. I'm going to raise another important thing that is regarding timing in, a, in another episode uh, regarding where John takes photos with his camera and gives it to uh, Detective Linda Arndt. Um, but let's just continue with the Khan's order. 
This is quoting further from page 11. Contrary to normal protocol, the police did not seal off the defendant's home, with the sole exception being the interior of John Bonet's bedroom. End quote. Now, I think, to be fair, um, what's happening is they first want to find John Bonet. There's a little bit of a difference where you present it with a crime scene where it's obvious there's the person lying dead, right? And so now you seal off the crime scene. And because it's not like that, it, it there could be quite a few different explanations. Um, and often in a missing person's case, you don't seal off the, the crime scene because you don't know if there was definitely a crime. In any event, the fact that they didn't seal it off is unfortunate, but you have the same thing in... Portugal with uh, the McCanns and there are quite a few instances where a crime scene is allowed to be a crime scene for an extended period of time. The Amanda Knox case comes to mind as well. The Chris Watts case comes to mind as well. Um, I also think that the interior of John Bonet's bedroom isn't the crime scene. I think if you were going to seal off a room, that's not the place to start. Probably a good place to have started was the basement, uh, but it's you know it, it's uh, difficult to actually say where the crime happened. I'm not 100% sure if it did happen in the basement. There are few reasons that might indicate that, but it's possible it could have occurred in another room as well, which I think says a lot. Going back to the Khan's order, in other words, any person in the Ramsey house could and often did move freely throughout the home. The Whites arrived at the defendant's home at approximately 6 a.m. and Mr. White alone searched the basement within 15 minutes of arrival. Mr. White testified when he began his search the lights were already on in the basement and the door in the hallway leading to the basement, the wine cellar, was opened. What's quite interesting is John Ramsey actually refers to this wine cellar as a coal cellar in it may have been the interview with Larry King that I played at the beginning of this clip. Um, I just came across it somewhere. I'm not 100% sure where he said that. But it is interesting that they that they're different names for this, this particular room. To me, it does feel a bit more like a coal cellar than a wine cellar. And the judge will talk in some detail about the details, uh, the, the interior of the room, the... The, how it, what the room, how the room appeared, and you know the evidence in the room and all that kind of thing. Um, I think it's very interesting that when Fleet White goes into the basement, he finds the lights already on. I, I think that is very interesting. I think it's interesting because I personally believe that the 911 call was made from the basement. I suspect the ransom note may have been written in the basement as well. It's possible that it could have been written in a couple of different places as well. But I think the 911 call was made in the basement and that is why the lights were on. And I don't think the lights being on in the basement would necessarily be easily visible from the outside of the house, right? Um, the amazing thing is that he also, Fleet White actually checked the the wine cellar so he actually opened the door and looked inside but he wasn't able to see anything because he couldn't find the light switch so everything could have been resolved in a you know if you're talking about the, the crime scene being compromised if John Bonnet's body was discovered then by Fleet White it could have changed a lot then Fleet White testified that when that when he went down to the, the wine cellar a window in the basement was broken, right? Now, this is going to be basically the focus of this episode is why did that not factor into the police reports, into the police's attention, meaning there's a broken window and it's apparently an open window. Now, bear in mind, right here doesn't refer to the window as being open, just broken. So why not? Um, why is it not? Um, they're looking for where the intruder, the kidnapper, got access. 
well, why are the cops not paying attention to this window? Think about what we're talking about. The the Ramses call 911 at about 5.52. The police arrive, more and more and more police arrive. And there's apparently a broken window and apparently an open window. And so why not, why wouldn't everyone gravitate around this broken open window? This is the, the, the this is the point of entry and exit of the intruder, right? Now, this is something that seems to escape Judge Khan's because all of this is dealt with in retrospect. So the importance of the basement window will actually be established later, right? Not on really the day of the, the day after Christmas. It's going to be established later as the intruder narrative is, is established. I just want to emphasize that if an intruder broke in, and there was something strange about windows being open, you would think that the Ramses would focus on it and draw the attention to the law enforcement, wouldn't you? If it was a genuine situation like that, and they were asked about, did, you know, was, were any doors or windows left open? You would think that at the time, it would be the focus of what would be spoken about, wouldn't you? And so we're going to deal with that in this episode, the fact that that didn't happen. Now, you can argue that it did happen, and it's just something that the police forgot about or didn't take note of. But we're going to deal with that in due course as well. We're going to deal with what the police said about the broken windows. And that comes through in Linda Oren's report. So now we go... Further through page, the middle of page 11, the court notes, however, that although plaintiff presents such evidence in support of his theory that Mrs. Ramsey was depressed and that her depression contributed to her state of mind on the night of December 25, such evidence, if accepted as true, cuts against plaintiff's theory that Mr. Ramsey assisted his wife in the cover-up of John Bonnet's murder. In other words, if the marriage was shaky, it arguably seems less likely that the innocent spouse would help the guilty spouse cover up her murder of their child. Now, I've got to acknowledge that on Patreon, there are a couple of people who suspect that Patsy was guilty or that the other uh, party was guilty, right? Um, and my um, counter argument to that is exactly this. It's if one of the spouses was guilty, it would make no sense for the other spouse to cover for them, not only to cover for them, but to be dragged through the mud of accusations. And in particular, if their marriage was shaky. And I have a sense that th their marriage wasn't, um, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't as perfect or a perfectly happy marriage. I think that cancer diminish the happiness of the, 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 the Ramsey home. And I also think that um, John was extremely busy and caught up in working at Access Graphics. And I think that, that took him away from the family home for extended periods. So that John Bonet missed him, but also I think Patsy missed him. But the, the glue that, that keeps family together is paying attention to one another caring for one another, being with one another. And I think some of that was was not the case. You could say going out the window. Um, the other thing is Patsy's focus on pageants, I think was that was her focus. And as a result, um, so the other thing I think just that does seem to support that is that the, the housekeeper didn't notice much warmth between the Ramses. Now you could say, well, they just like that as a couple. You know, doesn't mean anything. But I think it's a very important point to make that if the marriage was shaky and one of the one of the one of the two Ramses committed the crime, it would be the straw that broke the camel's back, and it would be the reason to say, okay, well, this marriage isn't even working now. You've really ruined everything, and so why wouldn't the one turn on the other? And that is the crucial question in this in this scenario. And I think it, it excludes them both. 
uh, from uh, directly committing the crime, this argument. I think it's a really a strong argument, but I also d don't think it has been answered yet to completion. I think this is also the reason why the judge ultimately went against not only the um, the the theory of Steve Thomas, but why she went for the intruder theory because she was presented with two theories. I think both don't make um, a lot of sense. Both aren't completely logical. You know, if you're going to say the intruder theory is valid, then you can also say, well, the ransom note doesn't really make sense, even with, with that. If you're going to talk about the intruder theory is valid, then your entry and exit point doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. Why would you not enter through the basement, but exit through kind of the front door or, you know, a door? Just um, find an easy way out kind of thing. A quick easy exit so there's more to say about that but let's move on uh, the judge does mention here or although referred to as wine cellar the room was actually used for storage and was a dark dirty area with mold growing on the floor and that was from Fleet White's deposition now we move to page 12 under the broken window mr. White states there was a suitcase along with a broken shard of glass now bear in mind the suitcase under the window is suggesting that that it's being used as a step in order to exit the house the same way that the intruder came in. As I said, it just doesn't really make any sense that you would come through the basement window, go up the stairs to the first floor, to the ma to the ground floor, and then perhaps up the spiral staircase to John Bonnet's room. To pick up John Bonnet. This is the scenario of the intruder theory. Pick up John Bonnet and then come back down the stairs, creak, 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 and then you would not just exit at a door that is right beside you. You'd pass several doors and windows um, on your way back down to the basement through this very difficult um, exit point. And you could argue that if the this is what the intruder did, he found he couldn't exit. He couldn't put John Bonnet in the suitcase and he couldn't carry her out. And so that plan failed miserably. In other words, exiting through the basement. I just don't think that it makes any sense that that would be the case. I just, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, nor does it make sense that he would leave the garrote behind in his murder weapon. And also that the other murder weapon possibly the baseball bat that didn't belong to the, the Ramses is also left outside in the garden but we'll get to that in a second so what is quite unfortunate just below the the top of um, page 12 or at the top of page 12 Mr. White does not remember whether the window was open or closed now I am going to make an inference here it's, di it's dangerous to do so but I think not remembering whether the window was open or closed, I think suggests that it was closed. What I mean by that is, I think if the window was open, you would have noticed it. You would have noticed it because it was bitterly cold, and you would have noticed it because it's something that is standing out. It's standing open, right? If you look at the crime scene photos and you imagine what you're looking at in that very cluttered basement is a closed basement window, you're not going to notice it's closed in the same way that if there are um, no, if there's no snow, for there to be no footprints in the snow, you're not going to notice that there's no footprints in the snow. You know, you don't notice something where nothing is noticeable. So, Mr. White also opened the door to the wine cellar room, but he could not see anything inside because it was dark and he could not find the light switch. What's great about Fleet White going down into the wine cellar is it provides context for when John goes down into the basement. It's also interesting that a friend finds his way to the wine cellar, but apparently the Ramses don't. Later that same morning at around 10 a.m., Mr. Ramsey also searched the basement area alone. He testified he found the broken window partially open. Now, what I think is interesting with that is 
according to this description here, it is the basement window is partially open. And we're going to get to that in a little bit more detail. Um, what I want to emphasize here at the moment is just that he's not saying the basement window was wide open, but partially open. Now, if you take that at face value, what that seems to be suggesting is that the basement window, if it's not wide open, then the intruder actually closed the window behind him on the way out. And not just that, that the door that he went into to, to go into that particular room was also closed with a chair placed against it on his way out. It just doesn't make any sense, does it? So we're going to freeze on the Kant's order uh, through about midway through page 12 and just deal with some of the statements made by John Ramsey in television interviews and in his book or in their book, The Death of Innocence. Shall we start with the book on the bottom of page 20 of the Ramsey's book, The Death of Innocence. He talks about the basement window and the circumstances around it that he remembers. He says sometime that morning, I remember a day back in the summer when I had left my keys inside and was locked out of the house. So he's basically talking in the book about sometime through the course of the morning, he suddenly remembers that he broke that window and then he ventures down into the basement and he says, I think about the basement now. I jump up and hurry down there. So he doesn't tell anyone. He goes down by himself. He then thinks things to himself. It's, it's um, written in italics in the book. He even uses the words, I tell myself. And then he says, the pane is still broken and the window is open. That, that, and that's all how he describes it. He just describes it as the window is open. And then, then the, the rest is kind of in italics where he's thinking, could this have happened? Could that have happened? Did the kidnapper get in here? Did, and did he, you know, um, did he use the Samsonite suitcase to you know, as a, as a stepping stone, not a stepping stone, but a object on which to stand to leverage him on the way out, right? And then he's, and this is the part that's so interesting. It's on the top of page 21, he's, he writes, I don't look further after finding the window open, but I carefully close it before going back upstairs. And then there's a quite a lot of italics after that. So that is just a quote from the death of innocence. I think the important admission there is that John says that he closes the basement window, right? Now, what I think that is telling us is that the basement window was closed for all intents and purposes when everyone else came down into the basement, right? I'm guessing, and I could be wrong, but I'm guessing that the basement window was closed all along, that when Fleet White came down, it was closed. I think he would have noticed it if it was open because it would have been cold. There would have been cold air streaming in. That um, Christmas night was a particularly cold um, evening. Um, Christmas Day was also particularly cold. I've checked the weather records. And you would have definitely felt that cold air. Bear in mind, there's also a furnace further in the basement, which would have been warmer, but you would have felt this cold air coming through there. Bear in mind that it also, trace snow had fallen that night as well. So it was cold enough for snow to fall and for snow to linger, certainly um, before the sun came up. I seem to remember a similar situation in the Oscar Pistorius case where he gets up in the middle of the night this is him talking about his scenario. He gets up in the middle of the night and opens the balcony door, I think, to bring a fan in and then brings the fan in and closes the balcony door again. So the end result is the same as the beginning result. I think the other thing that he did was he opens the curtains, opens the door and then closes the curtains again. But in terms of the story he's telling, what he ends up doing ends up being undoing itself. So it, it, it is as if it never happened. 
So I think this contention that John Ramsey closes the window and the window is then later found open is very interesting. I think the question is, when was that window opened? I have an idea it was opened at some time, possibly in the morning. It could also have been opened in the afternoon. It could have been opened by law enforcement. But that window gained uh, significance as the day wore on. Whereas I don't think even the Ramses thought of that as the likely route of the intruder or kidnapper. I mean, at the time. I do think somebody else paying attention to it, you know, do, do you think maybe someone could have come in this way? Maybe something Fleet White said may have um, made a little light come on in someone's mind. Before we move on from the open window, I want to refer to John Ramsey's statement on the 30th of April 1997 when he was interrogated by Steve Thomas and Tom Trujillo. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. And what he says is very specific. He says, um, he's talking about um, the window was open about an eighth of an inch and that he just kind of latched it. So he says, I went back down with fleet. We looked around for some glass again, still didn't see any glass. And so you can interpret this to that is when he talks about the window being open about an eighth of an inch, that that is actually part of his description of when he when he broke into the the that post basement window, right? Um, the other thing I think that we should just highlight is I don't think any fingerprints were found on that window, not of John Ramsey's, not of anyone. I could be wrong. I just I think that would have come out if that was the case. No fingerprints were found on the window, so. So why why not? Why aren't they there? Now, in the McCann case, Madeline McCann, the, I think the only fingerprints that they found um, that were relevant were Kate McCann's. And Kate McCann said she, um, uh, I think she went to the window or something like that. But why are there not intruders' prints on the window that the intruder used? Why are there no fibers? Why is there no sign of dirt or whatever? Anyway, um, we're going to get to that, you know, there's this contention that um, there were little pieces of um, popcorn stuffing, that plastic that is sometimes used to, to in, in the packaging of things. I think some of that was found distributed in the basement and someone said that was caused by the intruder coming in through the basement window. And then Steve Thomas responded that, there was nothing like that when they investigated the crime and or in crime scene photos. But when people subsequently came much later, and bear in mind, you had people coming in through that window like Lou Smith, testing the theory, then they, they would later find evidence of, you know, for example, Lou Smith coming through there and say, oh, isn't this what the intruder left? And so it's quite an interesting scenario where someone else coming through the window to demonstrate that it was possible leaving debris is now said oh this is the debris of the intruder because you would expect in a scenario where there's snow which is damp and leaves and dirt that it would leave a trail wouldn't you now i want to refer to the police report that detective linda Arendt wrote and she she wrote that John Ramsey paced between the area of the den and the formal dining room. John was usually by himself. I did not see John or Patsy interact with one, with each other. This is also something that she observed, right, that there's not much um, comforting of John, of Patsy or Patsy of John. And you've got to wonder, does this give reinforcement to the idea that their marriage was shaky? So yeah, you've got a second individual that is making this claim not making the claim in a direct way just that they are not being very warm to one another it goes on to say no one in the house made any obvious comment to me that it was after 10 10 o'clock and the suspected kidnappers had not called from the time i arrived at the ramsey house until approximately 10 o'clock i had a few brief conversations with john 
I had asked John if the doors to the house had been locked when the family went to bed last night. And I'm going to now deal with his response there after dealing with what John said in a television interview. I think this comes from the Today Show from 1999. So a year before the book was published, John Ramsey said, We had a basement window that was under a grate, a removable grate that I had used the past summer to get into the house when I'd lost my keys. I, I wanted to check that window. I went down to that room. The window was open. It was broken. I went back upstairs and reported that to Detective Arndt. Katie Couric says, you did tell her about the... John Ramsey says, yes. Couric says, the open window. John Ramsey, I did. Couric, and what did she say? John Ramsey, I don't recall she said anything. Now, if you go back to Linda Oren's report, she says, I had asked John if the doors to the house had been locked when the family went to bed last night. John told me that he personally checked all of the doors and all of the windows in the home this morning. All of the doors and windows were locked. John told me that although the house does not have, and then he talks about the alarm system. So Arndt specifically asked him about this, and then he never said anything. And she's referring to a time, she's writing this chronologically, and she's talking about what happened after 10 o'clock. That after this time that the kidnapper was supposed to call, she spoke to John about the doors and the windows. This was his opportunity to mention it to her, and it's certainly not mentioned in her report. Now, you would think that if he did mention it to her or to any policeman, that, again, they would, go, they would gravitate towards this entry access point, this entry exit point. You would think that they would study it. They would look... And I think one of the things they would notice is, especially if it had happened very early, they would have noticed, well, there's no footprints in the snow on the other side. And we've got a photo of that access point of the grate where there is snow and there's, there don't appear to be um, footprints, do they? In the 2016 NBC documentary, uh, the Dateline documentary, there's also a photo through the window which shows the snow right surrounding the grate and no footprints in the snow. So in terms of this open window, in 1997, Steve Thomas said, you know, you mentioned you went down in the morning, the 26th, and the, that window in the basement was unlatched. Did that strike you as odd or did you bring that to anybody's attention? So Thomas is now trying to push John into a corner, basically saying, okay, so if the basement window was odd if it stood out it was like wow this is really strange if it you thought it was important why didn't you bring it to anybody's attention and if you go to the um the, the book the death of innocence it does seem as though it strikes him as odd because he talks about i jumped up and hurried down then he goes straight to the basement window he says in italics, that entry place needs to be looked at, I tell myself. And and also at the bottom of page 20, he says, odd, I think. This doesn't look right. And so the question is, so it's very odd to you. You run down specifically to look at that. Well, do you tell anyone? Do you tell the police that are there to investigate that? And what I think is very interesting in the narrative, The Death of Innocence, is in the narrative, he seems to check the window, go back upstairs, and then he says, um, I, you know, I carefully closed it before going back upstairs. And the next line is, I constantly think about John Bonet. So he's not, he doesn't go back upstairs and tell Linda Arendt anything in this narrative, right? So that is what Steve Thomas is getting at is, so you, did you think it was odd? Now in the book he says, odd I think, but now in this 1997 interrogation, he asks him, well, you know, did you think it was odd? And John responds, I don't know. I mean, when I was, yeah, I think it was probably struck me as a little odd, but it wasn't, I mean, sometimes that window would be open because the basement got hot or one of those 
windows would be open so it wasn't Thomas particularly unusual John it was dra dramatically out of the ordinary but that is um, I thought about it so I'm not quite sure what John's answer is here is it is it um, strange or is it not strange but from what you you get here is that it wasn't strange enough to actually tell anyone about it but then in subsequent interviews he he says that he did it was strange enough to tell Linda Arndt about it but then Linda Arndt says she wasn't told now you could say whose word do you believe do you believe Linda Arndt or do you believe John do you think that Linda Arndt just forgot or do you think that John noticed the window and didn't really think much of it at the time? Perhaps he thought more of it later on. In 1998, Lou Smith also asked him about it. Did you tell anybody about that? John says, I don't really remember. And I think it comes up again. Tom Trujillo says, you know, did you notice if the room was overly cold? And what he's saying when he says that is, if the room was cold, it would mean the window was very likely open. And John Ramsey responds, no, it wasn't. I didn't notice that it was. And that is possibly the same experience Fleet White had. You would imagine that if he was in the house and he went into the basement and there was this icy breeze, literally an icy breeze blowing, that he would have noticed it, that he would have mentioned it. Something also worth mentioning in his interview with Lou Smith, he was asked about, you know, the, he said, um, I think entry was gained through the basement window. And Lou Smith answers, why do you think that? And John Ramsey says, because the window was cracked open. Now, cracked open in, to my ears, sounds like it was just open. It was open just slightly, right? In other words, it's almost like someone else might look at it and it looks closed, but it's actually just barely open. Something else I want to highlight from his statement is that he spoke about when he broke into his own home in the summer, that he said, you know, you've got to be careful if you drop those last two feet in the basement. You had no idea what was waiting for you at the bottom because there, there was a mess. You could have a suitcase like there was there but you could have all sorts of other things kids toys um, you could sort of crash onto something perhaps an artwork or something and so it was actually be quite dangerous in a way to land in this pile of junk on the other side of that window on Larry King in uh, March 2000 Larry King asked in the book, you write about the suitcase in the open basement window, but the police say you never told them about it. John Ramsey answers, that's false. Patsy Ramsey adds, false. John Ramsey adds, I told Linda Arndt that I found the window open and I found a suitcase under the window. They have photos of this in their crime scene photos. I've actually been trying to source that particular comment on Larry King. Um, it's about a 40-minute interview. I haven't listen to all of it but from the parts that I did listen to I couldn't find it. In the John Bonet series we sort of spoke about the narrative of neglect well doesn't this window fit into that as well where the window was broken the previous summer and then Thanksgiving goes by even Christmas goes by and they're about to go on a holiday and the window is still broken. Doesn't that give you a sense that things that need to be sorted out aren't. I mean, they, they cleaned up the, gl the glass, but they didn't fix the window. And when John was asked about this by Steve Thomas, he said, is there any reason that window went unrepaired? He said, no, I mean, it's Patsy usually took care of those things. And I just rarely went to the basement. So it just, I guess, got overlooked. Although she did think that she asked the cleaning lady's husband to fix it over Thanksgiving when they were doing some repair work there. But I don't know if that's ever been confirmed, whether he fixed it or not. So it's kind of being pushed onto the cleaning lady or the cleaning lady's husband should have done it. Well, we're almost at 40 minutes. I just want to go to Patsy Ramsey talking about this particular aspect. And she's interviewed by Trujillo. And he says, 
I, is there any reason why that window wasn't replaced or the pane wasn't fixed to anything? Patsy responds, no, I, I don't know whether I fixed it or didn't fix it. I can't remember even trying to remember that. Um, I remember when I got back uh, in the fall, you know, quite an interesting statement there. I can't remember trying to remember that. She doesn't know whether she fixed it or didn't fix it. Then she says, went down there and cleaned up all the glass. I mean, I cleaned that thoroughly and I asked Linda to go behind me and vacuum. I mean, I picked up every chunk. I mean, because the kids play down there in that back area back there. What's interesting is she says, I can't remember whether I fixed it or didn't fix it, but then talks about cleaning the glass and picking up every chunk. It's sort of quite um, specific memories. You can actually remember picking that up. Then she says, I mean, I scoured that place because they were always down there. Burke particularly and the boys would go down there and play with cars and things. And there was just a ton of glass everywhere. She goes on to say, I cleaned all that up and then she, she vacuumed a couple of times down there to get all the glass. And then, did, do you ever recall getting that window replaced? Patsy says, I can't remember. So we spent a lot of time just going into other materials, supplementary materials, just on the notion of this window. Was it open or closed? Who broke it? When was it broken? Now let's return to the Khan's order. Later that afternoon, Mr. Ramsey and Mr. White together returned to the basement at the suggestion of the Boulder police. That was actually Linda Arndt. During this joint search of the basement, the men first examined the playroom and observed the broken window. The men next searched a, a shower stall located in the basement. What's interesting is there's no mention of whether the windows open or closed in this particular part of the order. We're now at the top of page 13. Miss, uh, Mr. Ramsey then noticed a heavy fireplace grate propped in front of a closet. And Mr. White moved the grate so the closet could be searched. It's quite interesting that John notices this thing. Oh, wow, well, let, let's look at this. And it's propped in front of the closet, and then that is what they look at. And then they don't find anything there in the closet, and then they go to the wine cellar room. John Ramsey enters the room first, turns on the light, and upon discovery of John Bonet's dead body, he exclaimed, Oh my God, my baby. And what is interesting here is that it's just said quite matter-of-factly that John turned on the light. Now, bear in mind, when Fleet went, he couldn't find the light, opened the door, couldn't find the light switch, looked inside, couldn't really see anything, and then closed the door and, and nothing happened. In the Ramsey's book, The Death of Innocence, I'm going to read that moment to you as well. And this is quoting from page 22, about one or two paragraphs down. And he's talking about Fleet and himself in the basement, heading downstairs after that spoken to Orant. Quote, We continue our search and a few minutes later, I'm at the door by the furnace. I open it and see John Bonet lying on the floor with a white blanket around her. End quote. You notice no mention of the light switch. Now, there are two scenarios to imagine here. One is that John finds John Bonet and in the dark removes the duct tape, in the dark removes the one uh, ligature around her wrist, which is loosely tied around her wrist. The other possibility is that Fleet finds the light switch behind him and Fleet turns it on. But there's some interesting confusion about whether the light switch was turned on or not. So, returning to the Khan's order, quote, John Bonet had black, black duct tape covering her mouth, a cord around her neck that was attached to a wooden garrote, and her hands were bound over her head in front of her. She was covered by a light-colored blanket. A Barbie night, nightgown belonging to John Bonet was also found in the wine cellar near her body. John Bonnet's blood was found only on her body and the Bobby night nightgown. Mr. Ramsey ripped the duct tape off John Bonnet's mouth and attempted to untie her hands. 
He then carried her body upstairs. It was only upon the discovery of John Bonnet's body that the Boulder police began to securely, uh, secure properly the home as the crime scene. Now we're at page 14. John Bonnet's body was bound with complicated rope slip knots and a garrote attached to her body. The slip knots and the garrote are both sophisticated bondage devices designed to give control to the user. Evidence from these devices suggests that they were made by someone with expertise using rope and cords, which cords could not be found or sourced within the, the defendant's home. The garrote consisted of a wooden handle fashioned from the middle of a paintbrush found in a paint tray in the boiler room. The end of a nylon cord was tied to this wooden, a wooden handle and on the other end was a loop with a slip knot with John Bonnet's neck within the loop. The end portion of the paintbrush used to construct the garrote was never found. No evidence exists that either defendant knew how to tie such knots. I think I'm going to stop there. Um, I obviously don't agree with this at all. I don't believe that it was sophisticated, that these were sophisticated bondage devices. I don't believe that it was a garrote in the first place. But we're going to deal with this and the other evidence from the Khan's order in the next episode. Just another reminder that in tomorrow's live I'll be talking about the ABC documentary The Gravedigger's Wife and also some other things related to the Chris Watts case and also the, the John Bonnet Ramsey case. So if you have any questions be sure to join me there. It will be during a live stream at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Again, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do like, share, leave a comment and I'll see you guys next time.